Greatness is found in pure hearts that love Jesus Christ. Hello, welcome back. I hope that you are having a great Tuesday. If you were able to join us yesterday, I hope you are experiencing the same thing that we are here. Uh, and it is turning into a very, very special week. And so we're going to continue on the Passion Week, following what Jesus experienced that week. Today is Tuesday. If you're wondering how we are releasing these, the most keen-eyed viewer will realize that there's a big hint sitting on my desk where you can tell at least what time it is. But I thought I would mention it in case you're wondering how we're doing this. Uh, Pastor Matt and I actually came back to the office Sunday night, and we did yesterday's video um, on Sunday night, and that allowed us to spend yesterday with our families, which was a very good day. Um, and we are back here. We got together early Tuesday morning, early this morning. It's actually Tuesday. Um, we got together early so that we could start working on this project and hopefully have it released for you all. We're shooting to have it out at 10 o'clock each day. As long as technology works out, we shouldn't have a problem. So with that said, if you would please grab your Bible if you have it. Otherwise, you can just follow along and go to Mark chapter 11. That's where we're going to start today. And as I'm finding Mark chapter 11, I'll just briefly mention that um, there's a lot more scripture than we're going to be able to cover this morning. No question. Um, it would probably take over an hour to go through all the texts. We could turn it into a couple hour class just on all that happened on Tuesday. And Wednesday is a very full day as well. Um, we're going to cover some of the highlights, but there's some specific things that I want you to see. I, I just think most importantly, we, we, we want to know what Christ was going through, what he was thinking and what he was experiencing. And so know that today was his last public day. Uh, if you're wondering what scriptures cover Tuesday, I can give those to you and we'll put them on the screen right now. Um, so we have, uh, today is, uh, Tuesday is um, in the book of Mark. It's from Mark chapter 11 all the way to chapter 14. In the book of Matthew, he covers Tuesday from Matthew chapter 21 to uh, chapter 26. And then uh, Luke covers Tuesday chapter 20 all the way to chapter 22. John actually covers today. He doesn't cover each day. If you read John chapter 12, verse 1, John has Jesus and the disciples coming into Bethany, which would have happened Friday going into Saturday Sabbath. That was Friday. That was John 12, verse 1. And then John 12, verse 2, he jumps to Tuesday, which is today. And so um, you can actually be in John as well, John chapter 12. Uh, verses 2 through 8 for Tuesday. So those are the passages. Maybe you want to dig in and look a little bit closer. Um, if you're wondering uh, what resources um, I'm using to kind of put this study together, there's a couple of really good resources, and they would be worth, if you want to study the life of Jesus, they'd be worth investing in, because sometimes I think we lose track um, because it's spread across four um, gospels that are not synchronized. They're synoptics. They They... I uh, kind of review the life of Jesus, but they're not always perfectly synchronized for us. Um, there are actually really great resources. And here's just two that I have on my desk right now to help us with this study. The first one is called My Lord and My God. We'll put the name of this book on the screen for you. This can actually be purchased directly from the ministry that Edward uh, Barclay um, produced this from. And um, it's uh, First Baptist Church of Milford, Ohio. Pastor Matt actually bought this book, this copy. He purchased it when we were down there for um, a workshop, a servant's workshop. This book is fantastic. Another one which is a little bit older but is very well respected is The Harmony of the Gospels by Robertson. So really great resources. And what they do is I'll show you with this one. It aligns what's going on chrono chronologically and puts it all in columns so you can read them all together and see what's going on. And so um, there's a lot of uh, work that really awesome men have done, which saves us hours and hours and hours um, of study to be able to do something like this. And so just know that uh, I've concluded Thursday and it's not because it's how I feel about it. It's because I've studied it out. Uh, and used some really great resources 
to figure out what was going on with the timetable. So with that said, we're in Mark chapter 11. I'll bring your attention, if you're able to look at your Bible, to verse number 12. That's yesterday. And yesterday I pointed out the beginning of the day, Monday, and I said something weird happens at the beginning of the day that's going to become important on Tuesday, and we'll show you what that is. So on verse number 12, on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. This is Monday morning. Seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And there are, there's no fruit. And so in verse 14, Jesus answered and said unto it, he's talking to the fig tree, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And the disciples heard it. Um, and so that was Monday morning. Um, I would also just kind of briefly mention um, that the disciples um, on Monday night, they went back to Bethany, which you think about, 12 guys plus Jesus, like going to bed and sleeping arrangements, all of those things. Like it was a pretty big group of people. I just kind of wonder who stayed up last. You know, it was Peter the protector, the one that uh, took the longest to fall asleep before everybody else did. Or was it Jesus? Was Jesus the last one to fall asleep? Have you ever been over sleeping with a friend when you were a kid and you're laying there and you're talking to each other, you know? Uh, are you still awake? And you just keep talking. Um, I don't know if that's the kind of night they have, but it makes me wonder. And then I think about the morning. I, I bet you it was hard to get up before Jesus did. And so no doubt he was probably up and moving gently, quietly while the sun was, was breaking. And, you know, the guys wake up and they all have breakfast together. And so now they get ready and they're going to go back into Jerusalem for that two mile walk. So we come to Mark chapter 11, verse number 20. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried from the roots. This was a tree that was alive and now it's no longer alive. I mean, it's firewood, right? It's ready to be cut down, split and burned. Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursed, it's withered away. And Jesus answering, he said unto them, have faith in God. And we'll pause for a little bit here because I'm going to come back to this passage. There's a really special takeaway that's there for us. And we'll come back and look at that in just a second. I think there's a really uh, amazing devotional there for us that I wanted to draw out. But I want to talk about what happens with the rest of the day. Like I said, we're not going to read all of the passages of Scripture. There's just, um, there's just so much here. Uh, to try and unpack, but I did want to take you through just a couple of them. Um, so let me list out for you the things that happened. So obviously we see the fig tree dies. Um, he gets into Jerusalem. This is his last public ministry day, and they're going to question his authority, which um, I think that this is, um, it's worth reading. It's really, really funny. If you look at Mark chapter 11, verse 27, um, remember Jesus has cleansed the temple. You remember that? He had gone, he had looked around um, on Palm Sunday, and then he did that because on Monday, he, he, um, he throws the tables over, he chases the money changers out, he won't let people use the temple as a shortcut. And he says, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. And so he comes back the next day and he's had a night with the disciples, uh, with Lazarus and his family, but the Pharisees have had a night as well to think about what's happened. And so now they've got a plan. So verse number 27, um, the disciples and Jesus come again to Jerusalem. And as he was walking in the temple, there came to him, the chief priests, the scribes and the elders as a big group of people, significant group of people. They say to him, by what authority dost thou these things? Not just what you did in the temple, but remember, the first time he cleansed the temple in John chapter 2, he went in, he threw the tables over, he told them, you are ruining my father's house, fix your program, and he left. But this time, he purges the temple, he hits the reset button on the way they're doing worship, and then... He sits down and starts telling the people how things ought to be done. And no doubt, people are like, what did you just do? And he says, look, this is not what the temple's about. Well, then what's it about? And the people start asking Jesus about worship, about God. And it says they're amazed at his 
at his teachings. They're, they're blown away. So this is what the Pharisees are questioning. Not only did you throw over everything that we do here, but you tried to establish a different way of doing things. Who do you think you are? And so they ask him, who gave you the authority to do these things? This is what Jesus says. He answered, he said unto them, I will also ask of you one question and answer me. I will tell you by what authority I do these things. So if you answer my question, then uh, then I'll answer yours. Here's his question. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. Remember, not only did John baptize, but he also cried out, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And so they've not yet decided what to do with John because they just allowed the Romans to deal with John. They reasoned with themselves saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, they feared the people, for all the people counted John, that he was a prophet indeed. And they answered and they said unto Jesus, We cannot tell. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Neither do I tell you by what authority I do these things. If you can't answer my question, I'm not going to answer yours. You can see the tolerance for Jesus and the, um, the effort he put into developing that relationship. He's taken it exactly where he wants and needs to take it, and he's done with it. And so I'm not going to spend time answering your questions by what authority I'm doing these things. I think that that's a pretty good interaction. Let me list for you some of the things that go on, because Jesus comes into the temple, and he spends a lot of time in the temple. A lot of the passages that you're going to read are these incredible conversations that he has with different people. There's also one really special thing that happens in the temple, so I'll throw some of these at you. Obviously, the, uh, the challenge is authority, and he gives them the riddle that they can't answer. Um, Jesus gives several different parables, which are really fascinating. I won't take time right now, but in Luke 21, um, Jesus actually talks about a fig tree. Remember, he had cursed one the day before, watched it die in the morning, and then when they're sitting in the temple with all these people listening, coming and going, public epicenter and the place for spiritual teaching, Jesus starts talking about a fig tree. And he talks about how a fig tree comes into season. And then he mentions that that season reminds us of the end time that is to come. In um, the book of Matthew from 24 to 25, he talks about how bad it's going to be during the Great Tribulation. But then in Luke 21, uh, verses 29 through 33, he says, nothing is going to happen without my say-so. Nothing will happen until I say it is. And we know that he had cursed the fig tree. The fig tree didn't die until he said it was time for it to die. And this earth will not be done because of global warming or overpopulation, but because Jesus finally says, that's enough. And he actually talks about that in Luke 21. There's a lot to unpack here. We're going to keep moving. Uh, the Pharisees come and they ask Jesus about paying taxes that's an interesting conversation and he handles it so just i mean it's just perfect of course with such awesome wisdom the sadducees ask about the resurrection they were aware of it from the old testament but there was a lot of confusion and so they ask jesus specifically about the resurrection he teaches on that that's a topic that would be fun to dig into um the, a scholar comes and asks jesus what's the greatest commandment that's a really awesome conversation because we know the gospel. So we can see the gospel in it. That is, we find the gospel in the Ten Commandments. The gospel is a schoolmaster bringing us to Jesus. And the great commandment question actually shows us that. Jesus asks what they believe about the Messiah. And then he transitions and he gives the woe statements. Oh man, I wish we had time to read the woe statements. Those are a lot of fun. Matthew writes out what Jesus thinks of the Pharisees. And one of the names that he calls them is um, blind guides. There's a lot of really rough things that Jesus says to them. All of them absolutely true, but then he is also securing their anger to put him on the cross. The other really special thing that happens while Jesus is interacting and teaching in the temple, Jesus has moved back and he's sitting against the wall and there's a box right at the gate where you walk into the temple and people would give their gifts and folks, you know, the temple's super public. When you come in, you can see it and folks are standing around. You could watch gifts being given and a widow on Tuesday, not on Sabbat, but on Tuesday, 
um, comes in to give her gift. Uh, and it's two mites, it's all that she has. And she drops them in the box. And Jesus asks the disciples, um, you know, did you see the gift? It's the greatest that was given all day. And it's like, well, it was only two pennies. How is that the greatest gift all day? And Jesus teaches us what real giving is all about. Real giving and real love for God isn't how much you give, but how much you hold back. And he tells her she gave everything. And so it is that a person puts $1 in the plate and it's a greater gift than the person that puts in $10,000. If the person that puts in $10,000 holds back so much for themselves, but the poor person who put in a dollar only gives everything they have. So really awesome um, thought that Jesus gives. And then we keep moving through the day. Um, Jesus moves out of the temple uh, in the late afternoon and he spends some time in the Mount of Olives teaching the disciples. And we call that, um, Bible scholars call that the Olivet Discourse. So he sits down and he talks to the disciples on Tuesday afternoon. Um, in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus actually says, I'm going to be crucified. Um, we'll go ahead and keep moving. They, they go back to, to Bethany for the evening because it's they're going to have dinner in Bethany. And they sit down for dinner and something really significant happens. As they sit down for dinner, um, Mary uh, of Bethany uh, anoints the feet of Jesus. And John talks about it. Um, Matthew talks about it. The gospel writers all talk about this event that happens. John goes out of the way to talk about it in John chapter 12. So when she anoints the feet, scripture says... Uh, that the disciples complained and said this could have been sold for a lot of money, but she poured it out on your feet, kind of rebuking Jesus. And Jesus rebukes the disciple that says that. John tells us who it is. John tells us that Judas is the one that said this could have been sold and we could have made a bunch of money off of this. And it says that John says that Judas kept the person he was greedy. Jesus rebukes Judas. John is the only one that tells us that it was Judas. The other gospel writers tell us that Jesus rebuked them and said, you let her alone. She's done this for my burying. And you think about how beautiful that is. It's Tuesday. He's going to be crucified on Thursday and she's anointing his feet. And he says, she has anointed me to my burial. You let her alone. And then he says, because of what she's done, she's honored me in a way no one else has. The work that she's done will be preached as long as this gospel is preached. But the rebuke that John points out in chapter 12 is so important, knowing that it's Judas, because that's the catalyst event in Judas's life when he decides, I'm done with this guy. I know that I can make some money off of him if I turn him into the authorities. And that's the moment that Judas decides that he is going to actually betray Christ. And he goes and meets with the chief priests and he sells the life of Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And we think about that. Now, Jesus didn't make that bitterness in Judas's heart happen, but knowing that it was going to occur and that it was going to lead to his own death, Jesus could have easily avoided that with Judas. He didn't have to rebuke him directly. But I mean, Jesus knew. He knew what rebuking him was going to do and he did it because Jesus was that committed to getting to the cross for us. And I think you're starting to understand that. As you see him coming in and out of the temple, you know that he's doing this on purpose. And I want to go back to what we read in Mark chapter 11, just very, very briefly here. There's such an awesome nugget to take away of the many things that there are. This is what God laid on my heart this year when I was reading it. If I go back to Mark chapter 11, Verse number 21, it says that Peter calling to remembrance, he saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. This is what Jesus says, answering them. In verse number 22, have faith in God. Maybe you've heard this statement before and you didn't realize that this is when he says it. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Does Jesus actually mean this, right? 
if you if you say to a mountain, go from there to the sea, he says, you'll have it. If we keep reading, therefore I say unto you, what's, um, what things soever you desire, when you pray, believe, and you shall receive them, and you shall have faith. Really powerful um, truth right here. God's power and our faith come together when we pray. And it's the only way to access those two things. Prayer is, is absolutely essential to walking with God and seeing him do things on our behalf. He goes on and says, And when ye stand praying, forgive if ye have ought against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. And maybe you're, you're thinking about that whole moving mountain scene. You say, Pastor, have you ever prayed and moved a mountain? And I would say, no, I've, I've never moved a mountain with my prayer. Um, but I've seen God do a whole lot greater. See, a mountain is just immaterial. Do you remember when they, the disciples weren't catching any fish and Jesus says, cast your nets on the other side. And Peter says, we've been doing this all night. And Jesus says, just do it. And he says, okay. So they cast their nets on the other side and they bring up so much fish that their boat starts to sink and they have to call over another boat to help them. And you remember Peter gets to the, uh, to the shore with all of these fish, which he's fished his whole life and never caught fish like this. I mean, this is a miracle. You know, he falls down and he worships him. And he's like, my Lord, my God, who are you? You're awesome. And what does Jesus say? Fish? Fish? That would have been the greatest catch of Peter's entire fishing career and life. It's the one that didn't get away. It's, it's the catch he could have talked about to his grandkids, right? And yet, what does Jesus say? Fish? I'll teach you how to catch men. Fish are nothing. When you can win a heart, you've done more than move a mountain. And what Jesus is saying is that if you'll start praying for people, God will move things greater than mountains. If you'll believe that he will, he'll win hearts and he'll use you to do it. And just know this, when you decided or decide in your life, I'm going to love Jesus, God just moved a mountain. Isn't that awesome? And so the master continues to teach us as he gets ready to die for us and he's moving our mountains, isn't he? He's moving us and he's stirring us and we're seeing God do greater things in this day, in this age than even he did while he was alive, exactly as he prophesied that he would do. Father, thank you for Tuesday, for the study that is at hand. Continue to bless us as we dig into your word and keep us unified as we dive into tomorrow and see the transition from the public ministry to the private conversations. Jesus, thank you for the week that you put in for us. And we, we sense the picking up of pace and the shortening of time. But as the master of the universe, you lost no time. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.